name is Bear Siragusa, and you are listening to the Hunting Hound Podcast presented by W Hunting Supply. been that kind of a week for me too where just like every day i've tried to do something and every day like simple stuff has just turned into this epic like long long day it just and it's not anything that you would think would be long it's not like you know well i was repairing the car and found extra things that was you know wrong with it it's just like stupid crap yeah like i went to I went to the range here just to my last trip to the range before moose hunting season starts, which starts in like a couple days and, uh, was going to shoot in some, some new ammunition. Cause last year I used 150 grains, uh, 150 grain nozzler mm -hmm. and was happy with the results. I mean, you know, knocked down some, uh, it worked. Yeah, it worked great, but wanted a little bit more for the biggest animals. Cause I, you know, I took a, I took a cow that was like 700 pounds and she was like, you know, she, she didn't go down as fast as I would have liked her. I mean, she went right, she went right down. She was, you know, dead pretty quick, but still I wanted to, right. I would have liked to have seen more bleeding if nothing else right, from a double lung shot. But the, uh, so I went and got my, a buddy of mine loaded some ammunition for me and I went to test that out. And the first, uh, the first pull, you know, first shot, he had, oh, I guess he'd overloaded. I don't know what happened, but at least the, just this enormous kerbloosh and the, uh, uh, it knocked, I was so not prepared for it. It knocked me back and the scope hit me in the nose. And broke. You're almost a pirate. Broke my nose. Yeah. Oh, dude. You know you're not the first. Oh, I'm not the first, but no, I'm, not the last. Not the last. My dad. He's still. I've got the gun here, actually, and I can tell you, I know exactly how it happened. You know, mm. but he had a. It was an older, like an old style Savage 99E lever action. Mm -hmm. They got like a rotary mag. They're a pretty sweet gun. That's cool. And it's super fancy, you know, mahogany stock, oh, really nice. nice gun. And that was my 18th birthday present. And that's wow. actually, that's what I killed my first bear with. Cool. But it's got this huge, fancy, I don't know. I heard somebody refer to it as a Monte Carlo stock. I don't really know what that is. So that may be way off, but huge cheek rest, mm -hmm. super ornate, like really, really cool. But man, for the eye relief on it. I could see how running a cheap scope. My dad still got the scar. I mean, where he laid his eye open. That's that's no joke. I've been pretty fortunate. Knock on wood, you know. Yeah. I've never done it to myself before, but um this just caught me by the recoil on this one shot caught me by surprise. Um you know, I've shot I've shot 180 grain, you know, all the time, but um you know, I used to have a th I used to have a uh, 30 out six, an old Mauser that just kicked like a mule. So like the oh, recoil is yeah. no problem, but, um, yeah, it just, it really kicked and my nose was the closest thing, you know? And, uh, yeah, broke my nose, broke my scope. I had to get a, like <sighs> scramble to get a new scope and mount that and shoot that in before the moose hunting season started. And Dang. So it's been like these late nights every every night this week just trying to i know get shit to get my shit together <laughs> and i don't help you know with the time difference it's like i'm dragging from the day and you're like just waking up <laughs> yeah no i think uh, you're dragging from the day i'm uh, i'm dragging from not quite enough sleep after a couple of couple of those days <laughs> but no it's good it's good to get up early and you know, I, I i don't like sleeping in even when i can i don't like doing it i always feel like a you know, if it's if it's past seven when I get up, I feel like I've wasted a big part of the day. Yeah, right. Mm. But 
but yeah, no, but it's been, uh, it's been, it's been good though. I've gotten quite a bit of time out in the, out in the woods with, uh, with the dogs the last few weeks, which has been fun. Um, Mike's coming along really well. That beagle pup. Yeah. Mm. He's, uh, he's looking really good. I like how, you know, every time we go out, I can see him, you know, he's not light, lighting the world on fire, but every time we go out, I can see improvements from the previous time. That's um, all it takes. It's all it takes. That's what keeps us all going back, right? Yeah, I think so, you know, because I, I really enjoy that um, that aspect of things. And it's really interesting to me because, you know, I've got, I, I've, maintained contact with some of the other people who have bought pups from that litter and you know they've got like a facebook page and things for the kennel where we share progress oh, and yeah. things like that and um i can see that there's a there's a tendency and i it, it's all over the place on I've, I've just i've just gone on a long rant about this on another on my previous episode of this podcast so i, I won't do that again but <laughs> there is a tendency to there's a tendency for people to compare themselves to what's happening online sure you know and uh, I can already see that tendency where people are already starting to get a little bit frustrated with their pups and I mean these guys just turned six months old I mean they're they're babies they're puppies, puppies. yeah like puppy puppies not like you know almost two and still not doing it. It's like we're yeah, talking, right. <laughs> we're talking still figuring out where their feet are in relation to their ears, sort of a deal, you know? And, uh, yeah, people are already starting to get frustrated, which is, uh, which it's is, hard. Uh, you know, I really enjoyed that episode because it's, you know, the measuring sticks are really different mm. for everybody, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, I guess, yeah, if you're going to compare your, driving abilities to Richard Petty, right. you know, you're going to fall short of the bar. Nobody's messing with the king. Right. But, you know, you put it realistically and it's a whole different ball game. I, I hate to say it, you know, the whole lower your standards up your average, but, you know, realistic goals. And I thought that was good. You guys hit on because it is, yeah. it's a big deal. Don't let other people um, dictate your happiness or your your uh joy in the process yeah oh, I, at home pretty well thank you yeah no it, it's something that's been irritating me for a while is that you get you know and it, being relatively new in the sport myself you know i i was lucky that i came into it from a with a lot of experience from other dog sports right so i knew what to expect i knew i was going to get you know a uh, meet a lot of cool people, get a ton of support, but at the same time, I also knew that I was going to get um, some crap, you know, online when I ask, if I ask questions, you know, I got the, you know, your standard, you know, what kind of a dumb question is that? Are you some kind <laughs> of a moron? You know, it's like, and I knew that was coming. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I am, <laughs> you know, and. I knew it was coming, so I was prepared to deal with it. But, you know, some of these young kids, and I, I see it so often, you know, some of these young guys and gals getting started enthusiastic about their, you know, their hound that's some crossbred thing that their neighbor had puppies off of, you know. Right. And they're all excited about it. And then they just, you know, they just show up on one of these hound pages and they just get their butts kicked yeah by people who really should know better i mean we're talking like it's not the youngsters being bozos to each other it's it's just like these you know it's like people in their 50s you know <laughs> and it's different now like trust me that's all been there it just it used to be face to face like it was your buddy flicking your crap and treating you like some flunky kid brother you right know? now it's it's easy access at your fingertips and you get it from every direction 
Right. I'll take the lickings I got like early on in person over that any day. Oh, any day. Be- because at least, you know, like I've given people a hard time about their dogs and I've taken some hard lumps about my dogs as well, you know, in person sure. from buddies. No problem with that. Like zero problem. That's a right. You know, you can look at it as sort of a rite of passage in some ways. It's like, yeah, oh, exactly. It's, it's your initiation almost. Right. It's like, you know dogs go running by with a with whatever your target species is and your dog's peeled off running off on something else and you're like where's your dog bear (laughs) i don't uh see your dog on the gps let me zoom out here you know it's like stuff like that (laughs) you know that's okay yeah right well that's all in good fun but it's the you know it's like i remember i remember one young gal who hopped on to uh, hopped onto one of these pages and posted a picture of her blue tick um, that she'd just gotten from somebody after it had had puppies. And being inexperienced, she the the female was thin after having puppies. Oh sure. So she fed the female more to get her up, you know, to get her weight. And it went a little bit too far. She was a little too fat. And, you know, midsummer, whatever, they can be kind of chunky, like the, right. in my head, like between seasons, it, it doesn't, bo- doesn't bother me much. But, you know, realistically, to be functional out in the forest, she was too fat. Right. And, you know, instead of being like, you know, hey, good job getting the weight back on her after pups. That can be hard to do. Maybe consider cutting her back a little bit before you guys get out in the <laughs> woods. Back you know? a bit. Right. You know, some constructive feedback. It's just like people like people who know better. You know, people who are higher profile in the sport. Right. We're like you know, what is the matter with you? Why is that dog so obese? You should be ashamed. You're like really tore into this poor woman. Really? And it was just such a shame because there was, it was such a teachable moment. You know, you could have gone in there and given this woman a really positive experience, some good feedback and left her feeling jazzed about Oh, now I know what I'm supposed to do. Now I've got one more thing that, you know, instead it was just like, you know, I, I, I actually ended up reaching out to her afterwards and was like, Hey, you know, realize that the people that are trolling you online right now, um, are, you know, they're, they're, they're not the people you should be listening to anyway. Right. You know, because they're spending their time posting fluff pieces on Instagram and Facebook and trolling beginners. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, and that's such a hard, I mean, we'll rabbit hole. We're in this thing a little ways far enough to rabbit hole. Right. Mm-hmm. You think about like the keep of a dog. And I've talked a lot about this a lot lately with buddies and, you know, it just always comes up. Mm. There's the fun part mm-hmm. hunting and training and, you know, getting your getting your time you know that's my therapy that's my time out in the mm-hmm. woods with my dogs and i i enjoy the hell out of it but the keep is something that it, it's a whole lot more than just feeding and cleaning kennels mm-hmm. you know it, it's there's a lot to it in learning dogs i mean a different metabolisms they process things different they pack on muscle in different ways mm-hmm. some need this some need that mm-hmm. and you can take it to such an extreme to where you're just this total weirdo right i mean like when we all get on the phone and talk about what our dog's poop looks like for an hour with four right. buddies right you know that's crazy <laughs> it, it's ridiculous but at the same time you know, I remember it wasn't all that long ago we were going through a bout with, you know, a pretty popular dog food company, you know, that we were all feeding. Mm. And all of a sudden we're all on the phone like, dude, what is up? Are you seeing this? Like something is yeah. not right. Mm. And everybody switches away. And next thing you know, it's like, boom, recall, recall. six months yeah. later. Yeah. 
And it's like, dude, I could have told you that long time ago. Right. But your customer complaint department doesn't want to listen. Right. But, you know, a couple of hound guys that are, <laughs> you know, really watching, right. it, you notice those little things. And I think that's the hard part when you're not, when you're not involved. I mean, I don't want to say like it level A, level B, level C, but you know, the people who are hands-on and really working dogs mm -hmm. multiple times a week, mm -hmm. more than just, Oh, good dog. Here's your, your dinner. Right. You notice things way different. Sure. I mean, yeah. I mean, you see everything. Yeah. Hands, and hands down. It, you just don't know that unless, unless you're at that level or you've seen it. I mean, how do you, my grandma always says, how can you teach unless you've been taught? Like you, right. you don't know. Right. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you that, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it, it's such a difficult balance to find online. You know, yeah. it's, it's why it's so important for beginners to kind of get that person that they can go and talk to and you know call up on the phone it doesn't even need to be somebody in that you are in person with you know i talk right i get all kinds of good advice from you know people like johan plank and and you know i talked to St uh uh stefan uh kikta and mark defrain mm -hmm. and george uh lambert and you know people like that who are just out there all the time yeah. You know, and I've never met any of those guys in face to face, but I'll still call, you know, I'll still touch base with them, you know, once a week For sure. with where we'll just sort of, yeah, check in a little bit, you know, it's right. And see, you know, see what's, see what's going on, share some experiences, you know, like I, I had a, I asked them all a question here uh, a couple of weeks ago, just, or I guess it was last week, just asking you know, because it suddenly it started, I started to wonder a little bit, you, you get into sort of some of the fine tuning things about how you do, how you do things. And, you know, it can mm -hmm. be something as simple as we had a long conversation, like a message thread about, um, it was about, yeah, gosh, sorry. My morning, my the, the caffeine's kicking in, so I lost <laughs> my train of thought here. Um, yeah, we were talking about uh, how much do you speak to your dogs while you're actively hunting? You know, mm -hmm. because that's a good topic, right? Because you know, you got you have people that will drive, and then they'll drop their dogs on a track, and then those dogs are gone, and you don't have you know you you might see them at a road crossing, but otherwise you're not going to have any contact with those dogs until you get to the tree, you right. know, and then you've got other guys like, you know, like George or like me or like my buddy, Eric, Eric over in, uh, over in Sweden, who's a tremendously good dog, uh, dog man, you know, where we don't necessarily have that option or we choose not to use it. If nothing else, where we'll go out, right. you know, George will get out on a mule and just ride until they cut a track. I'll get out on my feet and just walk until I cut a track. You know, then there's a lot more, you, you spend a lot more time interacting with your hounds before most of the time, before things sure. you know, heat up and how much do you talk to them? You know, uh, how much do you, you know, do you, do you give them encouragement? Do you, you know, and it was just a really interesting conversation about, you know, people's differences of opinions, you know, so, some of some people are like, oh, you know, once they're on the ground, I don't say a word to them. I let them do their thing, you know, and right. other guys are like, well, I want them to know when they're doing well. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give them that that encouragement. And it's it's. Um, it's pretty interesting in terms of just the small nuances in training and, and feeding and care that you're like you're talking about here. It's it's. It, it can get really, really finicky. Well, the keep, I mean, it goes, it goes so much deeper. It's one of those multi-level things, right? Like, and, and none of us, it, I shouldn't say none of us. There are guys out there that have made it a real craft, 
Mm. I mean, like with any kind of working animal, we'll, we'll put it that way, working animals and the keep of them. Oh, yeah. You know, there are some true masters of that. And yeah. the rest of us are all, you know, hopefully aspiring to that mm. because it's not even just the physical keep, the mental keep on them and keeping their minds right. Right. Which, which sounds, I mean, I'm sure there's people out there right now that are thinking that this guy's full of it, you know, because maybe I'm giving them more credit than, than I should. You're not. But I also know for a fact, if you keep a dog's mental state in the back of your mind when you're doing any kind of training, yep. it makes such a huge difference because it's like, you know, we have, let's say, five hours to go out to the woods. Mm -hmm. We got to make the best use of that. Most of that training is without me. Mm -hmm. So I got to make sure that I'm doing my part in other ways. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, absolutely. And it, I, like, for example, I got this young dog, Angus, out here. It's a great and he, name. <laughs> he's a, right. The boys named him. He's big and black. Like he is long, man. He's like a limousine. Just really, really nice put together. Cool. Foxhound, you know, Pacific Northwest stuff. Yep. And uh, for a while, we were just talking about it last night. My buddy says, man, I'm sure glad he came together because he had the puppy ganglies like you wouldn't imagine. He would, For about three months, he was the ugliest looking dog I've probably ever owned. And then it was like, boom, dude, you look like a racehorse. Right. I mean, just super nice put together, cool. came into it. But he he's a weird little dog in the fact that he is way smarter than most people would ever give him credit for. Mm. You know he's always been a little mouthy and I have been getting really lazy about it and was letting him get away with, you know, barking at feed time and, you know, little stuff. You mm -hmm. make excuses. It's just, you know, he kind of started slipping. And finally one day the kids were like, Angus is just barking. And, and you know, we're talking for a few 30 seconds, whatever, but I don't like letting my dogs bark at all. And uh, I said, well, we're going to go fix it. I went down there and I know this dog is flat smart. He knows it's kind of like your kid, right? When they don't know that they're doing something wrong, you, you right. can be mad at the situation, but you can't be mad at the kid. Right. Right. So this dog, I'm like, you know, darn good and well, what the rules are. And I, yeah, I'm letting it slide. But I went in that kennel and the boys, I don't even know what they thought I was going to do. You know, they're like, dad is serious. Dad's done with this. I said, I'm done. I'm not putting up with it anymore. Mm -hmm. He's done barking. And we went in there and we had an eye to eye conversation mm -hmm. and we had one tone from a caller mm -hmm. and that dog has been stone cold, dead silent for the last three days. <laughs> and, and it's not like it's a collar wise thing. He's not packing a collar since we came home from hunting. Right. He just, he kind of gets it. And I knew we were going to get back to the woods after their big layup. You know, they haven't been out in quite a while mm. and it's like, okay we're shifting gears. We're going back to work. Right. You know, what's going on. We're going to start on this. And then we go to the woods and we, we let him do his, you know, individual study time. Let's mm -hmm. call it, you know, he's out running with his peers and learning that. And then we come home and it's like, okay, we've switched that mental mindset to where he know he knows what's going on. Right. Yeah. But, you know, it's just knowing that mental you know, if a dog is not smart enough to comprehend what you're telling them or doesn't know, hasn't been taught in the first place, it's a lot different. It It is. Yeah. And not only that, it's, <clears throat> it's such a crucial aspect of training. And, you know, I, I agree with you. There's probably going to be people here who are like the, these guys are just talking, you know, smoking if caesar milan's listening though we're, we're yeah. out for hire yeah exactly <laughs> um you know but it, it, it's taking care of that mental aspect making sure that that you and the dog are actually on the same page before you start to get frustrated yep. is something exactly. that is i see it all the time in the dog mushing world still and, you know, I see it all the time in the hound world where people will start to get frustrated because, you know, they maybe they had a dog some years ago 
that they just let out of the box and it just like figured it out super fast and was bomber that whole, you know, that, that whole time. But most dogs aren't like that. And to keep doing the, th- you know, to do all of the same things that worked with your previous dog and then think that this, your current dog is not as talented or not as good because it's not picking up on those things. You know, you may have a not super talented individual. That's possible. Sure. And, you know, life is too short to be wasting time on a dog that doesn't want to, doesn't want to hunt. I get it. But at the same time, I believe that we have more responsibility. And this is, this is where people start to sort of pull back from me when I'm talking about this is that there's, you know, you, it, There is a level of responsibility that we have as the, you know, breeder, trainer, owner, you know, whatever of these dogs to try and figure this out, you know, put a little bit more effort into it than, well, I let him go and he didn't keep up with the pack or he still can't keep up with the pack or he turned around and came back to the truck. You know, there's all of these things that. If you look at, if you choose to look at it negatively, if your if your default setting is, oh, that dog sucks, every yep. time it messes up, you're never you're you're never going to have that a good dog. I don't believe. I think you'll end up with dogs that you feel are pretty mediocre most of the time, unless you're really lucky and you get that one dog that somehow just figures it all out I'm in free. spite of you know, uh, how little you're actually putting into it. And I'm not talking about time. Right. You know, there are people that get out, you know, four or five days a week for five, six hours a day, you know, or, or nights or whatever, and they still can't make it happen. You know, I'm, I'm one of those guys, Mm -hmm. you know, I buzz. He's, he's toasted. Like he's, he's mentally, that dog is fried. He burned out. He burnt out hard. And, you know, Dan, Dan is still chasing moose. He probably will till the day that dog dies. Probably, you know, and it's because, you know, that's a dog that I got started. I got him when he was five months old and had this thought that, okay, I'm just going to start from the total basics, just like I would with an eight week old puppy. And that was a bad call. Because what I would do with an eight-week-old puppy is I'd just go out and walk in the woods, get them used to being out in the woods, that kind of thing. Right. You know, just let them them chew on trees and stumps and chase butterflies, you know. Yep. But with with Dan, that ended up not being the right move because what happened is he met a moose that kicked him in the face. And it uh, one of the first times we were out there and it sort of ignited this hatred of moose that he still can't can't shake right you know so i messed up there and it's something i've done then differently with with mike Mm -hmm. but the difference also being that he was you know i had him from eight weeks old you know so i could do i could do that sort of forest training that learning where their feet are and learning how to get over stumps and through pricker bushes and things like that you know, so, um, but, you know, I'm still at that point where I'm in year five of this now. Year five now. Yeah. And I still, I've learned a ton. I still don't have that sort of super stable, problem free dog. Yeah. And I don't know that I ever will. Cuz every dog's got its stuff. Oh yeah. You know, and it's I I'm having a ton of fun with Mike. I had a ton of fun with Dan. I've had fun and and learned a ton from every every single one of my dogs, but it's it's like I say it's this if I went into them all with the same attitude. I would have very quickly ruined Dan if I tried to 
train him like I did Buzz. And extremely quickly, I would have broken Mike if I treated oh, him yeah. like he was a five month old plot when he was eight weeks old. You know, it's like, yeah. So it's it's one of these things where I wish that people would take a little bit more time and use a little bit more self examination, like examine what you're doing. And if that that's hard, though, it's hard. I, I think oh. that's the hang up for most people. It is because yeah. you don't want to look at the grand scheme of it. Like you think, well, you just said you got, you know, a multi person chat. You know, you're talking about things. I mean, really, that's half these podcasts. It's fun talking to people because mm -hmm. we get to talk it out, you know, firsthand and people get to listen. Right. But if you think about it, if we can't figure something out, we contact people who that we feel are more experienced mm -hmm. or have experienced something similar or worst case, you go social media, you go YouTube, right? Right. Google. I mean, I hate to say it, but if you're a hound guy and you've never Googled something to do with, you know, dog training, you will at some point because you're going to start, you know, bang your head against the wall with something. Right. Um, to me, like we are all of that for that dog. Yeah. That dog doesn't have access to YouTube. It doesn't have access to, you know, it's kennel mates other than, Hey, I'm just going to kind of watch what you're doing. And if I have the mental capacity to learn, like some dogs just learn better. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure you've seen it. Oh yeah. You got dogs that are natural ability. There's dogs that know how to learn and there's dogs that can, compute all that and put it to work oh sure but if you don't have that you know you've got to do your part to try to figure out what you can do to make that dog tick right it, it's like it may not be speaking english but you might find something common where you can get that point across to that dog and it's a whole different ball game from then on out yeah absolutely you know what and, makes them tick right exactly and it, to be able to do that, you need to look at, you need to look at the equation in its entirety. You know, you need to look at what am I doing in my approach to this dog that is not functioning, you know, cause the chances that you have a dog that's so dumb that, and has zero of the genetic instincts that it should have, it's pretty slim, realistically. Sure. You know, you might have basic instincts. Yeah. Basic, you know, uh, a dog that's been bred for thousands of generations now for hunting. It might be dumb as a brick, but there's still going to be something in there ticking. And it might not, you know, it might, you might boil it down. Might to not look, meet that level. Right. Like the required skill level. Right. You know, and I think it's totally okay. Like I've said, it's totally okay to eventually call it a day with a dog because you realize that, you know, hey, I am not equipped to deal with this dog. You know, and that like, that was the realization I came to with Dan was that, you know, I do not live in an area with enough road to be able to get in front of him. And if he gets out into that national forest, I mean, I can't. He's gone. He's gone. I can't, I can't get to him. I tried for days to get into him here last year and, you know, didn't manage, you know, I was, I was looking at getting a helicopter to go and get his ass, you know, and <laughs> really expensive dog, man. Yeah. I mean, and in the end, you know, I just realized that, Hey, I don't have enough game here that he wants to run. I have a ton of moose. And this dog requires, he's going to be better off with somebody who A, knows the breed, B, has access to an area where they can hunt, where they have three or four backups in terms of roads to get into him, oh. um, which I just don't have, you know, and <clears throat> it's, that's, it, it requires a level of, of honesty and it can be brutal. You know, it still bums me out. That whole, that whole Dan thing still bums me out big time because I really like that dog. Oh yeah. 
And he had a better. I he mean, saved yeah. your life. Yeah, he has. I mean, the, the rabid goat wasn't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The uh, the, <laughs> the the attack goats were uh, yeah. swung right, swooped right in there and saved my bacon. But yeah, you know, it's like I I think the very best dog trainers, and I'm just so that's clear. I'm certainly not including myself in this <laughs> no uh, group. Um, but they have an ability to look very critically at what am I doing right now and what is this dog taking away from what I'm doing right now? You know, like talking to, talking to, you know, a guy like Jared Moss. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's ridiculous the amount of insight that guy has into his own, what he's doing. Oh yeah. You know, he's, his ability to problem solve. Yeah. His ability to problem solve, not just like, you know, it is really remarkable to me. And it's something that I yeah. strive for in myself to look at, okay, you know, like I, I I'll sort of segue into a story here. Um, <laughs> you know, last year on the second day of the season, people have heard this story before, but I've got some new information that might, that puts this into a little bit of perspective here. Um, last year, Buzz took out a fox pup, really young, like a little one, uh, caught up to it just as it went into like a day den, pulled it out by his tail, bit him in the face. It ran off. He ran off after it up into this wooded area, went maybe 200 yards. And then I could hear his voice change, got real boogery, real uncertain, eventually went silent passed me at a dead sprint and hit under the truck. Yep. I remember that. And I'm like, really? Really? Like we're talking a, we're, we're talking a 10, 12 pound Fox pup. Well, and you said it just barely got yeah, it. Yeah, barely even, got right? it. Like, like this one little, this little Nick, nose. like wasn't even really bleeding. Not even like through all layers of skin, like path- pathetic. Right. Is what I'm thinking in my head. I'm like, really? This 90 pound dog is afraid of a fox now. He's going to be afraid to go out and hunt because a fox bit him in the face. I was like, okay, you know, you just got to take a deep breath. Just keep getting out there. Eventually it'll work itself out. I was out there all last year. Never worked out. Yeah. He didn't run another track that year. Didn't he? He ran one at the very, very end of the season for a few hundred meters or a few hundred yards. And so I'm like, the whole time I'm like trying to work with myself, like what, what have I done wrong? What have I done to screw this dog up, you know, uh, so that he's that weak? It didn't make sense to me that he was that weak. You know, if he'd, you know, if he'd been struck by lightning while he was out chasing a fox, I would understand him not wanting to go out and chase a fox again. You know, it's like, but um, I started up again this year after a summer, you know, he had the summer off. And, you know, he took out a fox, did pretty well, you know, for the first day. And I was like, oh, you know, maybe there's some hope here. Got him out again uh, in a similar area to where we were when he had an issue last year. And almost same deal. Took out a fox, ran up into this wooded area, suddenly went totally silent, ran at, you know, 20 miles an hour down to the road and then ran home, ran ran like five miles home along the road like something environmental is what yeah could... i'm i'm like okay what is going on here and I'm, I, at this point i'm thinking okay i can't use any more time on this dog you know he's he's three years old he's ditching me you know he's ditching me in the forest and go and running home basically yeah so you know the next day i went out in that same area with vipi and dropped her and she uh, you know, she went out and, you know, was, had a pretty good search going, you know, covering quite a bit of ground. And suddenly about 150 yards from me, she locks down and just blows up. And Vietpi, when she's face to face with something, tends to bark at about 65 barks per minute on the Garmin. Mm-hmm. She was at 120. 
Oh, just racking them off. Just blowing <laughs> up and not like, not like, blah, 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 but just angry, like, ah, rah, 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 rah. you know, really just angry, aggressive, gnarly barking. And, you know, so I'm hunting fox in my head. I'm hunting fox. So I've got a shotgun with me with number three shot in it, you know, I'm, so I'm strolling over there, you know, thinking, oh, this is, you know, an interesting day. <laughs> I get to about 30 yards and suddenly like the some self-preservation instinct kicks in and I stop and actually listen to what's going on, like more than right. in, in like my peripheral. And I hear her freaking out. And then I, and I also hear this like, oh, 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 and this like clacking noise, like clack 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 you clack, won't clack. forget that noise if you've heard it right and i'm like i don't think that this is a fox you know like you know light dawning on a wooden you know on a stone statue here um, thanks Mr. Like, yeah patting myself on the back for eventually coming to that realization the wind shifts and she blows out of there with a brown bear yeah and suddenly so you think he came across something like that. Suddenly it all started to make sense, you know, cause this bear yeah. is, you know, this, this bear, I walked into where she had him, this, there was a huge blueberry patch and, you know, I still had Buzz's log on the GPS. It was right where he broke off and ran home. It's right in the same area where he broke off last year. I'm thinking really? at this point, you know, I don't know for sure, but it, it suddenly gives me some more information. At least the day before, I am fairly confident that he broke, that he bumped into that bear. Yeah. You know, awesome. that he was running a fox and suddenly this monster, you know, rose up out of the blueberry bushes. And, um, you know, it. it's one of those deals where at this point, it doesn't even really matter what it was that scared him, whether it was the fox that scared him or the bear. Regardless, at this point, he's afraid to go outside. You know, like he mentally, he's yeah. not equipped to be to do this job. He's just not sure, you know, and that's okay. That's okay. I don't know what I could have done to change that. I don't know if I could have mentally toughened him up as a pup or something like, that, you know, anymore because he was i mean he was killing it the first his first season was killer oh yeah he was like coming on hard oh my gosh he was he was on fire like he was killing it just such a good dog that first season and then suddenly in the space of 10 seconds he was done yeah and you know that's so i understand why you would give up on a dog because at this point like that's where i'm at with him is i can't use i'm not going to use any more time trying to convince this dog that there aren't monsters out in the woods because at least one time probably twice he has he's experienced something that's told him that that's not accurate and he's not right. mentally tough enough to be able to, to be able to deal with it you know whereas dan or Vipi would have you know like vitby was all over that bear for like an hour and a half and yeah you know i had to pull her off because it's not allowed to run bears with hounds here um so i pulled her off the second time they crossed the road i i was able to pull her off um which felt like kind of a bummer to me actually but you know. but yeah doesn't that suck <laughs> but that's okay you know she's She's, uh, I was very pleased with her that she had the, the gumption to, to, to stay with that bear. And, um, you know, I've had her out after that and, you know, she's still perfectly happy to be out there. Yeah. But you think about, I mean, compare that to a, a situation that might be more relevant to anybody out there that like even bear hunters. Mm. You don't own those dogs anymore because they didn't have it. They didn't have the stick. They didn't have the gur. They didn't have, you know what I mean? Like mm. they, they, this might be unpopular, but just like with any other piece of game, I feel like there are those dogs that are just born to do that. Like there Absolutely. are born 
bear dogs. Mm -hmm. Not dogs that catch bears, not dogs that run bears. There are born bear dogs. They're, I'm going to say, few and far between on the grand scheme of things. Mm -hmm. And when they find something that works, there's a reason those guys work so hard to breed it mm -hmm. and keep those traits. It's not always... I think people really get genetics and traits really like just tied together when really you got to look at them as totally different things. You can have dogs from the exact same genetics mm -hmm. that are going to show completely different traits and right. the genetics don't get lost. Traits are lost so fast in a breeding program. I mean, that's why I feel like the dogs, the dogs that have those standout features, like, I don't know, for example, like a, a certain locate, a locate ball, mm. okay, or, you know, voice, um, you know, and, and I don't mean like the tone, but like tongue on track kind of deal, sure. how they run and track, if mm -hmm. they're open, if they're, if they're, you know, quiet on track, mm. um, belly up tree dogs versus sit back tree dogs, tree climbers, um, you know, all those traits those are they're they're really on a razor's edge i think because you can lose a lot of that so fast but yet you can also bring it back in mm -hmm. almost as fast if you make the right right crosses and right decisions there but yeah you know like maybe buzz just didn't have it i mean just That's like it, like i'm saying any other bear dog prospect that doesn't make it i mean there's guys that you know, that I really respect and I've talked a lot with about dogs mm. that'll say, I can tell you if an eight week old puppy is going to make a, a real bear dog mm -hmm. or not just by putting it on bear scent. You know, you'll have the ones that kind of hunker down and don't want to do anything. And you got other ones that are winding and ready to go. Mm. It, it's that predatory or dominant scent. You know, a bear is a big musty animal. Yeah. Just the smell of it or Heck, anybody who wants to try it, go pick up an eight-week-old puppy and go walk over to a horse if they've never been around it and see what happens. Right. You, you know, you're going to get covered and you're going to be wet because it's right. just, it, it's so <laughs> different. Uh, I don't know. Again, maybe we're just thinking way too deep and giving them more credit. But I don't think so. I, I totally I agree it. that the, the distinction you just made is, it, it's such a great one you know, the, 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 the difference between genetics and traits, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's, it was something that I've talked to a lot of dog mushers about and very few of them have been on the same page as, as I have. And I'm not saying that I'm right, but it's something that I think about where, yeah. you know, when I, when I was deciding what to breed in my sled dog kennel, I would look at not just the genetics, cause obviously that's important, but I would breed to a dog that was performing, d doing the task, performing the task that I wanted them to do the way mm -hmm. I wanted them to do it. Right. You know, because if you take a dog from, you know, one kennel that has, say, for example, won the Iditarod, and then you take a dog from another kennel that has also won the Iditarod, and you, comp and you breed those two dogs together, If both of those dogs have won Iditarod, it should be a good breeding. But there are different, there are a lot of roads to, to roam, you know, oh, yeah. and those two dogs may have done that totally differently. You know, you may have a, the one guy might have run 10, 12 hours in a stretch and rested, you know, for five or six hours, whereas the other guy might have run four hours in a stretch, rested for two hours. Right. You know, and that's going to require a different type of dog. You know, you're going to have one that's going to cover ground really fast and recover, but needs that little bit more time to recover. Or you could have a dog that covers ground a little bit more slow, but then you don't need to put as much rest into those dogs. Oh, yeah. You know, and it's well, and it's the same with the popular opinion, but same with these dogs. And, you know, I would say the hunt drive is genetics mm -hmm. like if we're going to tie you know throw things in a box your hunt drive the grit um to some degree i would even throw in there mm -hmm. it is genetics 
uh you know grit's funny because it, it's a trait too but i do believe like a truly gritty dog it, it, it's it's in the genetics oh absolutely and it's so strong that it's it's just been bred and bred and bred mm -hmm. but when you look at track style i feel like that is 90 percent keto traits mm. over genetics the mm -hmm. drive is there that's what's driving it but how you get from a to b like i'll say there's several dogs in my kennel that are really close related that you would look at them you'd think there's no way they're related yeah. they hunt completely different mm -hmm. but yeah you know that's where i feel like the track style it plays in the, to a lot of the traits and how they handle the situation sure and just because those dogs are doing a great job you know you may pick a different dog to breed that might not be always up front but it doesn't mean it's not going to produce something that you like and is really valuable and bring something to the table too. Sure. Sure. Is that sort of, is that something, uh, as you're building a pack, cause that's something I don't have any experience with in terms of the, the hounds. Cause we don't run the packs here. That's right. You don't pack. Them we don't there. pack them here. So I, you know, I can draw some sort of comparisons between the sled dogs and things, but with a pack, are, are you looking for different traits like do you like as i was putting together a dog team i would look for different things that different dogs brought brought to the table to come you know sort of you know to make a dungeons and dragons analogy you know you you get these things so you've got this you know you, where you're covered you you've got your power players and then you've got these things where you're it kind of keeps you covered right. in case of certain eventualities and that's always how i put together my dog team is that you know i would have the speed leaders but then i would have that slightly slower dog that i put in the middle and kind of protected for you know but that i knew could would get me out of a storm or something like that could you know do, is it. it the same with the packs where you do you want them all functioning the guys, same way yeah. i think a lot of people do I, and i used to you know you had People say, you know, oh, yeah, that's my start dog. Right. Or he's the locate dog. You know, it's not doing any of us a, a real service there. You know, ideally, they're all going to be exceptional. Mm. I mean, that's what we all strive for is a dog that will strike, trail, tree, it locate its own game. Mm -hmm. But there are definitely dogs that you lean on more in certain situations. Sure. And, and I don't think it's something that. I personally put on them like I decide okay you're going to be this dog so we're going to work on this mm -hmm. it's more run the dog see where the natural ability is and then try to find uncomfortable situations you know like those dogs that aren't real good start dogs right put them in situations where they have to be you know they'll rise to the occasion a lot of times given the opportunity and it may take a couple of real frustrating trips on, you know, let's say you go start a fox that dog A could get up and trailed and jumped and running. Mm -hmm. And the other ones are going to go 20 minutes before they say a word and go 100 yards. Right. But they're working it. So you're just trying to build, grow their, uh, grow their tool set. Yeah. But you got to give them the instruction and put them in the right situations, I think. Right. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. And I was having a really interesting conversation with um, John Steiner Wungen, who's a very, very good plot guy uh, over here and bear hunter um, over here. And I did an article about him for bear hunting magazine. And oh, cool. in that article uh, that came out, I think, two issues ago, we were, he was talking a little bit about a dog named Ace. That was, um, uh, I believe, if I'm not remembering this wrong, was a, was like half Steve Moore's Ursus stuff and then half Laurel Mountain. Mm -hmm. And that dog was it, just incredible to the point where he made everybody, and it was interesting hearing John talk about it because you know, he, that dog got, that dog died and John had this crazy good pack of, 
of plots. And then Ace died, and they were still good. Uh, like, don't get me, don't get me wrong, but they were not that like super duper high level pack, right? When Ace was gone, and it's like he he always appreciated Ace, but I think it's one of those things where you don't know what you got till it's gone. Where it's just like, holy moly, like this dog was doing so much more for me than I was aware of. Then you realize, you know, and I think he was aware of it because he was, he he had nothing but good things to say about Ace, like way before he was gone. But, you know, I think he was surprised that, you know, his, how much his pack depended on Ace. You know, you know, uh, not even sometimes that they're doing all the work, but right. It's weird. It's like encouragement. It's a team. You know, I mean, they're pack animals. They work together. And when you disrupt the apple cart. Right. Things are different. Yeah. No, exactly. You know, the boss is gone, basically, is what it what it boils down to. You know, that... Heck, I wish you would have been in the car with me the other night. That was uh, it was fun because my buddy, you just went riding with me. Yeah. You know, I, we took out my dogs and I, I picked up a couple, you know, what I thought were really nice really nice dogs that I kind of, I mean, I had room. I wasn't looking to add anything, mm-hmm. but at the same time, I, I know the value that they can bring. Right. But it was so funny to watch because we both had the same perspective. You know, here's a, a group of dogs. We got six dogs in the woods. Okay. The majority of them have seen a pile of game. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, other than Angus and even the other one, Twitch, you know, she's still a young dog and not as experienced, but she's seen enough game and knows how to run. You know, she's doing really well. Mm -hmm. But it's funny because I compare it to like those dogs that just stand there and wait for other dogs to do the work. Mm -hmm. Right. They'll just stand there and look at another dog that's sniffing and kind of take it all in. Mm hmm. And you think, oh, you're just sitting there letting someone do all the work. Mm. And, and that is the case sometimes. But at all different points in the night we're watching, and it's every single dog. Every one of them at some point is stopping and watching. Like you were watching the pecking order and the job descriptions being laid out. Right. Like in one hunt, that was our first trip to the woods together. All of them isolated with like these, they've all been in the woods with these Most new dogs been in the woods together yeah with these two new ones okay so it's like you know you were taking dogs that knew darn good and well what they're doing know how to catch game mm-hmm. but yet different situation it was funny to watch mm. and to see them all work together and get through that i thought man you know that was one of the best nights i've had in a, a long time right just because they got good exposure you know, the races weren't ideal, but they ended up really well. Mm -hmm. So we got to leave the woods on a good note. Like you all got to meet each other. It was a great meet and greet as far as, you know, working together. Mm. We had a good end result Mm -hmm. and everybody kind of figured out, okay, I can trust you. Okay. Well, that dog starts this track and it wasn't junk. So I can trust you too. Like we left the woods. Everybody was pretty much on a, on a good page. I felt like, right. So it'll be interesting to watch that. Like, that's the thing that I'm watching is you never want a dog to just get complacent and lazy. Yeah. But if you aren't looking at it with open eyes, it's like that might be the first place you go. And then you realize, no, nah, it's all of them. They're all just trying to figure this out. And it yeah. was pretty, pretty cool to watch. That is cool to watch. You know, that that is super cool to watch. And I, I love I love watching those things resolve themselves and it's, it's, it kind of ties back to what you were talking about earlier with, with taking care of their mental well being. You know, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, I find it harder to do now with hounds specifically because I'm running just the one hound at a time. But you know, when I, when I train a lead dog, for example, once that dog is like finished, I almost never run that dog in lead. Right. Which sounds insane. Like I put all this time into making this really good lead dog and then I don't use it in lead. But that dog, once it's finished, it's finished. Like it, it, I've got that there. I would rather then protect that dog in the middle of the team so that I've got it when I need it 
and then sure. put more effort into training my, you know, other up and coming leaders. And it, it becomes this thing where I, I will intentionally take that, that key animal that makes it so that we perform at a very high level. I will intentionally take that animal and put it in a situation where it is more or less out of the equation in terms of the overall performance of the team. Right. To try and encourage those young dogs to learn how to do the job on their own without that dog there. So if I do lose that dog, I'm not suddenly sitting out there in the middle of nowhere with an entire team who's like, well, <laughs> who are we following? Who are we following here? Because it's not going to be me. Yeah. You know, and that's how most how guys, I think, look at it. You know, I backed myself in a corner because I didn't make those dogs. I mean, I went from having rig dogs to not at all. You know, we just road hunted. and mm. Then you start realizing, well, that's because I screwed up. You know, I got complacent. Right. And I, I, I would say, you know, the game, it was easy to find when you patterned it. It was easy to just go get on them. And, mm-hmm. You didn't think about it. Well, then you start realizing, well, shoot, now I'm really kind of wishing I had that. Right. You know, or yeah. you bank on that old dog for, for starting a track. And next thing you know, that dog's gone. Like you're yeah. saying, and I've been through that multiple times now, you know, where you lose that quote unquote lead dog. Mm. But every time it's funny because it amazes me at what happens. Like mm. there's, Oh, I'll give you an example. Our very first blue dog, Haley, mm-hmm. she was what most people would not consider a good a good dog. I mean, and I, I will probably go down and say and she would have been a heck of a lot better without me. <laughs> you know, I didn't know what I was doing. But yeah, she held this weird place in the pack. So I hunted a lot of her offspring. And I think that might play into it. Mm-hmm. But those dogs, it was funny. You could turn them all loose together and she'd get out ran every time. I mean, it's not like she was running the front ever. She was always right there, usually, you know, 50, 100 yards behind. Mm-hmm. And then you'd realize if you turn those same dogs loose without her, obviously she wasn't pushing the track. Those dogs were faster. Mm-hmm. Hands down noticeably would move a track <coughs> way faster without her there. Mm-hmm. It's like they were honoring her enough that they would get out in front and still do their job, but they weren't going to leave her. Right. And when she was gone, I pulled her from that situation. It was like somebody flipped a light switch on and they just, they didn't care. You know, at that point they're running to catch instead of just running to be a little bit better. Right. Or, you know, last year when I lost rain, that was a, that was a big one. Yeah, that was a bummer. It, you know, it, you just you rely on those dogs to do a lot of the training, but then at some point you got to kind of rely on that training as getting transferred to those younger dogs and give them those shots. Right. Where when you have limited time, it's not as easy to do that. You know, guys that are getting to hunt one day a week or one every two weeks, you don't want to screw up that one chance you get, right? Right. Yeah. But you're yeah. doing nothing but hurting yourself on the back end. You just, you pay those consequences later. Right. Yeah, it's, it's true. And, you know, it's, but again, it, it, you know, we're getting into the sort of psychology of the whole thing. You know, if you're looking yeah. at the hounds just in terms of, you know, dumping the box and they get the job done, you don't care how it's just like, you know, they do them. I'm going to dump the box and then I'm not going to plug in again until they're barking trade. Right. That's okay. But then you're not going to have the depth. Most likely you're not going to have the depth in, you know, it's like that old saying that the, you know, a a baseball team is only as good as its bench. (laughs) Yeah. It's true, you know, and it's, it's, it's true. You know, you don't have the dem the depth of your, of, in your bench of guys who can step up and actually perform, you know, you've got to be, you're going to have to be real lucky to get through 
more than a couple seasons without losing one of those key dogs for even for a day with some injury or sickness or, you know, pregnancy or whatever. Yep. And it's such a crucial aspect of, you know, teaching the, teaching those young dogs, you know, like I, I'm doing with Mike right now, you know, I've, all of our training right now is, is based off of, um, building his confidence. And, you know, I, I screw up constantly to, to the point where it, it pisses me off how much I screw up. You know, I just did the, I just, uh, like I'll, I'll, I just did the other day where I realized that I, in my head, I'm thinking this is a pup and I know better. And it turned out that I didn't and I screwed up. So, you know, we were, we were out and I'm still working on getting him onto, you know, as, as many rows as possible. These roe deer is what I'm, I'm hunting with them over here. Right. And, um, you know, season's not started, but we're out there, we're training, we're in the woods, you know, collars on, we're, we're going through the motions. Um, I just don't have a gun with me right. and he starts to track and I'm standing in the road and I look off to my right and I actually can see the deer and he starts to track where it crossed the road 50 yards behind where we were and starts in the wrong direction. Cause I'm like, the deer is right over here. And I go and look yeah, where he started to track. <laughs> I can see him. Right. I got like, I, I, I think I sent you a video of it. Actually. I videoed mm -hmm. the, like videoed the deer. It stood there forever. So Mike goes tearing off wide open blah, 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 up into the woods. And he does this like curl around and hits the road again. And at this point, I'm, you know, the deer has moved on. And I'm like, okay, I need to, he's run this track backwards. I'm going to call him in. I'm going to put him on this deer track right here. So I call, I call him off. He's fully, you know, he's still doing his little puppy thing. I call him off, haul him all the way back up there, put him on that track. And he just like ditches me, hits the road, runs all the way back down to where he was and opens up again. And I'm like, man. You're, you're, you're running this backwards, dude. Not like I, so I walked down to where he was or where he'd taken out again. And I see that not only, not only had he been correct and there was another deer that he was running that hadn't crossed the road yet, Oh well. but the deer that I had seen had then, when it left me, crossed the road and rejoined that other deer. So I suddenly yeah. have two sets of tracks just running pell-mell down this road and I had wasted five, ten minutes pulling Mike off right. to get him onto the deer that I could see. And it was a stupid, yeah. it was a stupid mistake. It was a yeah, stupid mistake but... to make. <sighs> devil's advocate though right you know it's like look, is monday it? morning quarterbacking but still you know it's because i look at it like this i mean everybody will say you got to trust your dogs and mm -hmm. i fully believe that like mm -hmm. you have to but a dog has to be i i can't remember i know i talked about this with someone dogs got to show it's trustworthy too Absolutely. you know right like you can't expect like i would have done the same thing probably you don't think in that situation it it's hard because those dogs don't know. Like he doesn't, Mike doesn't have the experience yet. So it's like, yeah, you could trust it, but you could also be duplicating another Dan issue. You don't think back to that, like where he got on the wrong piece of game. That's what flipped the switch. Right. I mean, you don't want Mike, you're not chasing hairs with him. Right. Which I mean, not inherently what they're doing. Uh, well, the, the ones here are actually bred m more for deer or as much for deer really? as they are for hair. Um, you know, I, at this point he's so young that whatever he, I don't mind if he runs hair because mm -hmm. hair, they, they, they run such complicated patterns that it's such good training for their noses Sure. to run. And you know, the deer, as long as he runs deer as well, um, so it's not trash, right? The, the hair aren't not. trash. You know, I don't want him running moose cause then he's going to get stomped, but I don't think he would either. I mean, he's not, you know, he doesn't have that 
plot mentality of, you know, oh, you hurt me. Well, Eat it. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to F you up. You know, it's <laughs> mess you up. <laughs> Mike is a, they're like the MMA fighters of the dog world. They, I think. they really are, you know, like it's, that's one thing that I don't really miss about Dan. I loved that dog. You know, I, I still love that dog. He's such a good dog, such a, such a cool personality. And, but you know, that dog, you could look that dog in the eye and he could be eyeballing like a leftover hot dog from one of the kids and be like, I wish people could see your face right now. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you can, you know, he'd be eyeballing it and I'd be like, Dan, don't even think about it. And he'd like eyeball it again and look over at me like, you could see, he's like, is this going to be worth it? And any other dog I've ever owned would have come to the conclusion that, no, nah, this is not worth it. <laughs> but Dan would be like, you know, half of the time he'd be like, I'm going to do it. And he, he would do it. And, you know, con I'd come down on him, consequences, and he'd be like, oh, I regret everything. But then next time it'd be like 50 50 whether he'd do it or not. Yeah, right. You know, whereas. Whereas Mike, all I need to do is like he, even a beagle. I mean, he's more food driven than any other dog I've got. You know, I can be like, hey, 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 hey. And he'll come over like, oh, I'm sorry, boss. Right. You know, totally, totally different animal. <laughs> totally different animal. And, you know, and you talk to your dogs a lot, like going back to that conversation, mm. vocal cues and how those dogs respond to it. I mean, I'm sorry. Another rabbit hole, though. Yeah. You talk to your dogs a lot. I talk to my dogs a lot too. It does not take much. I mean, even like to get a dog to stop a track. Right. Or on the handle side, I feel like that plays a lot into it too. It it does. And not only that, but my experience has been that the words that I use, the commands that I use, they, there needs to be some kind of consistency there, obviously. So are you just going to confuse, confuse the dog? But so much of my communication with my dogs is tone of voice and body language. Oh. You know, where I can say, you know, I can say to a dog, I can get a dog to come to me without saying anything. Be by how I hold myself, how I, how I interact with that dog. In terms Just of the nonverbal cues, nonverbal cues. Exactly. So, you know, I'll, you know, I, I do talk quite a bit to my dogs, but most of the time I'm not saying anything worth, worth they don't need to remember it. Right. They don't need to remember or understand what I'm saying that what they need to understand and what I'm trying to convey a lot of the time is just, you know, if they're a little bit uncertain, I may say something, you know, to the, to the effect of, you know, whatever, you know, my, if they're uncertain, it'll be like, yeah, I bet you wish your mom was here today. Hey, eh? yeah, come on. We, yeah. we, we got, we got this, <laughs> we got this. You're all, you're all set. Let's, let's walk over here. Let's walk over here. Maybe it crossed over here, you know, and I'm not saying anything that I want that dog to understand. The only yeah, thing I want that dog to understand it. is that, you know, I'm a little nervous right now, but hey, dad's looking pretty relaxed over there. Maybe I don't need to be nervous, yeah. you know, or, you know, it's, it's things like that, you know. Or, well, recall. Think about anybody who's had a dog and recall. You get a puppy. Yeah. You squat down. Come here, puppy. Come here. You know, treats, whatever. You quit saying anything and you duck down like that. That dog's going to be in your lap. Oh, yeah. You know, the, the nonverbal cues are huge. They're so huge. And I wrote an article actually for you guys at DU about that. It's on, yeah. it's on your website about the body yep. language. And I told a story about like a buddy of mine that he had a young dog. It was out running, uh, running Fox did a great job. Like to my eye on the GPS, I was real happy with how that dog was. I would have been real happy with how that dog was working, but, uh, you know, his attitude was that she wasn't putting enough pressure on the fox to get it to go to ground. No. Um, which ended up not being accurate. Uh, she did get it to go to ground, but it was an in, 
it was in an area where he, he was frustrated that she wasn't putting enough pressure on him, but then it was in an, in an area where, he, <coughs> excuse me, he then decided, oh, I'm not going to go in there now. Oh, he gave up on his part. He gave up on his part. So he stood, we were standing on a stone wall next to a cemetery, and he was standing there, and he was waiting for her to come back. He had hollered up to her on this big hillside. She was a few hundred yards away, but, you know, the acoustics of the valley were such that she could hear him. Oh, yeah. And she started coming back, but, you know, he's he's calling her, and, like, I can hear in his voice this slight irritation. So this dog comes slowly back, and then on the other side of this field, there's another stone wall, and suddenly you see her peek her head up over the stone wall. <laughs> and she looks at Just scoping it out. Yeah, she looks at him, and... He's standing on this stone wall, all puffed up and frustrated. And he's like, get over here. And she, of course, ducks her head behind that stone wall and does not come. And I'm, yeah. and he's like, starts, he gets all upset. And I'm like, dude, what you need to do right now is you need to sit down. You need to pull out a cigarette. You need to, you need to chill out. I get, wait until she pops her head over there. And don't even say anything. If you are sitting there, relax, stretch out, like stretch your legs out, cross your legs, put your hands behind your head, chill out. Yeah. And it was exactly, exactly that. The next time that dog popped his head over the wall, she's like, he's sitting there. He looks pretty relaxed. All right, I'm going to go over there. Didn't, and she comes ball, you know, running in no problems whatsoever, but it's a f full body language deal. Yep. And, you know, that's, that's kind of what I want. If I was saying something that I was expecting to get a specific response from a command, then I'm going to use a command. Mm -hmm. But if I am just trying to convey an attitude, convey, you know, change the, change the atmosphere a little bit, that's going to be a body language thing. Right. And a, and well, a verbal think... cue thing. Think of your commands. I mean, how many commands do you really use? If you break it down, I mean, maybe I'm wrong in my thinking here, but like five commands. Yeah. Uh, you know, five, six commands, really. Like to my dogs, you learn up. Yep. You learn down. Mm -hmm. You learn in. Mm -hmm. You learn here. Mm -hmm. And you learn wait. Right. I think quiet. <coughs> Sorry. Let me throw that one in there. Quiet. Right. Enough is the word around this house. But really, I mean, my kids even, they're like, Dad, why do you always tell the dog to get up or down? I don't care if they're coming up and down the stairs in my house. It's get up there mm -hmm. or get down here. Yep. And and I'm sorry. Maybe I'm totally oblivious and, and off my rocker here. But when I'm hollering at dogs and they're hearing echoes in the mountain mm. and they understand what down is and what up is, yeah. I do think it makes a difference. I, it, I believe that it absolutely does. You know, and it, but it, as you say, it's, you've got a list of commands and I do too, you know, I've got things where, you know, I'll say, you know, like I'll, I'll put a dog on a track or call it over for a track. I'll say here, 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 here. And they'll come running over like, oh my gosh, dad's got something here. Right. And, you know, I'll stick their nose, you know, they'll stick their nose right where my hand is and then they'll start following that track and I'll be like, go get them. And then, you know, that's their cue to just, you know, that's the release that's there. This is what I want you to do. This is what I want you to focus on. Yep. You know, and then I'll have the, you know, come here, get down. Shush. If they're barking, you know, I, and when I give a command, it's obviously going to be in a very different tone of voice. And it's going to be a very consistent tone of voice when I give a command so that there's no question of, does he really want me to do this? You know, right. It doesn't mean that I'm screaming my head off or anything, but, you know, I'll say, hey, get down. You know, yeah. which is very sort of dun dun, very clear, very sort of clear tone of voice, you know, but, you know, if I've got a dog that's, you know, pops its head over, uh, over a ledge and looks down at me, you know, I might be like, Hey, what are you, what are you doing up there? Come on, f find your way down. And right. I'm not expecting it to be like, okay, I need to go and find my way down. Yeah. I'm expecting it to be like, okay, well, dad's dad's feeling all right so i, I want to hang out with him yeah i'm gonna go hang out with that guy exactly yeah. you know and it's yeah. it's 
it it's it, to the naked naked eye to na- the naked ear <laughs> it might sound like i'm just like chattering and it's like why would this guy's dogs listen to him at all how much this guy talks yeah but for for me it's my dogs know 100% when i've given them a command because it may sound like just mindless dribble but i am very very deliberate about what i say especially the tone that i say it you know i can be really angry with a dog and be like you know you know like dan, dan running a moose for the bajillionth time <laughs> you know i want to go up there and you know scream obscenities at that dog potentially but i'm going to be like dan come Dan, come. Dan, right. Come. There you go. Yep. Come on. Yep. Oh, good dog. Yep. Yeah, you're a big old piece <laughs> of shit is what you are. Yep. No, if I had dynamite, I'd blow you up right now. Come on. Yep. That's right. go. Yeah, we're gonna go home because you suck. That's what that's right. We're gonna go home because you suck. And it's like, you know, if they could if he understood English, he might be offended. But right. you know, he what he's listening to is my tone of voice. Well, and a lot of times, with, like, yeah, go ahead. Verbal breaking, yeah. it, you know, like I think that there are a lot of dogs. Like, yeah, obviously we have tools for trash breaking dogs, and I'm not saying you shouldn't use those. I mean, it's greatest tool ever, right? But, but we don't, we don't have that here. Time. Right, you don't. That's mm-hmm. the crazy thing. So crazy. So you you look at dogs and how they react. You know, you can watch that change in a dog mm. right in front of your eyes. I mean. If I'm scolding the dog, I, you'll look at him and you'll swear like those dogs are just, they're more ducky than I would like, mm. but it's because the majority of our interactions like that, we're cool. You know, we're buds. And when dad's mad, dad's mad. Mm. You know, like if I'm, I'll get over the top. See, I'm the opposite. When I give my commands, when they're in trouble, mm. I make it worse sounding than it really is. Like, oh, I'll I, look at people with me and be like, I'm not that mad. I do, but the they same. don't need to know that I'm not that mad. <laughs> right. Oh, I mean, and I do this, I do the same, you know, the, with the, like with the calling and Dan thing, that's when, that's when I've gotten in front of him, he's done and I'm getting him to come to me. Right. Like, to call him like with, with Mike, you know, we bumped into some sheep up there the other day and he was like, he was like deciding, I could see that he was deciding, am I going to chase after these things or am I not? You know, right. and then it was like, you know, I, I used a, a harder tone of voice with him, not enough to scare him, you know, not be like, ah, yeah, you know, but enough to be like, hey, 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 nope, yep. nope, nope, come here, leave it, leave it, you know, where it was very clear to him that this is not something dad wants me to do. There was no question there of, you know, and, and that's necessary, you know, you've got to have. I like to have that panic button on my dogs where I can say, you know, I can say, leave it, you know, say it hard and angry and have them just hit, you know, not hit the deck and like, oh shit, I'm about to get smashed here. That would, that's not what I'm going for. And that would bum me out if that happened. But they're like, oh, dang, dad is serious right now. I might, oh, yeah. I might not do this, you know, and it's your last warning. <laughs> right. I mean, it, it's the same with kids, right? You know, you want to have right. that, you want to have that when you suddenly turn around and see your three-year-old running pell-mell out towards a, you know, towards a street, you don't want to be like, Hey, sweetheart, come on back here. I don't want you to get hit by a car, but um, but um, but um, you know, all yeah, it's right. too late. It's going to be a, <laughs> you know, it's going to be a, Hey, stop. And right. you, you want to have that break, not because they're afraid of what you're going to do to them, but because they're afraid b- because they it's so rare that you use that tone of voice that when you use it, it's like, oh, something's right. up. Something's up here. Yeah. Well, that's it, a good way to put it. You know, and yeah, it's but I, I agree with you. It's it's so much of it is. It's, it's discouraging sometimes how deliberate we need to be when we're training. I think 
Oh, I agree. Because it would be awfully nice if we could just go out there and, you know, put on a podcast and just check out, you know, let the dogs do their thing. And sometimes I really wish I could do that. You know, but it's then like those a are second job though. Yeah. But then those are days where maybe I just don't go out that day. If I'm not willing to give that dog my, you know, my undivided attention. Um, yeah. It might not be a day to train for me. You know, because I think that's smart though. I, I really do. I, I wonder. Mean, yeah. Nobody wants when you don't want to be there. And I mean, by don't want to be there, we all want to be there, but you have obligations. You're going to be rushed because you got to get to a birthday party or you got this going on in two hours, but you can go here. It, you know, I, I'm not a firm believer of it. any minute in the woods is a good, like dragging a dog out to the woods, feeling rushed, throwing off your whole feng shui. You know what I mean? Like <coughs> your method is off, your routine's off, you're rushed, you're, everything about it is off. It's like, I really do think sometimes you're better off just staying at home. I agree. It's better than leaving a bad impression on them. I agree. Especially when they're young, you know, especially when they're pups. <coughs> you know, I, <clears throat> excuse me, my gosh. You know, I've, on Mondays, I don't start work until I work the evening shift. So I'm done at like nine or 10. So I don't start work until, you know, noon or one. And I'll take an adult dog out on Monday, but I won't take a pup out on Monday. Sure. Because I don't want any aspect of what I'm doing with pups to feel rushed or impatient or irritable. I want, you know, a, an adult, I can call that dog off and know that it's not going to learn the wrong lesson from me calling them off. Right. You know, but like with a pup, it would it, you know, I, if I need to be to work, if I need to leave by noon, I don't want to have to call a pup off of a, off of a roe deer or off of a, whatever, a fox, whatever yeah. at 1130, because I need to go. I'm not going to be able to convey to that dog that the only reason I'm calling you off is because I have something I need to go and do. I got to work. <laughs> right. I got to go to work, pal. You know, it's, it, the dog's not going to understand that. So what lesson is that dog going to learn? Well, it may just learn, you know, it may learn that dad called me off of that. So maybe I shouldn't do that next time. And obviously that's going to have a lot to do with body language and how you convey mm -hmm. pulling them off. But still, you know, it's, it's, what are you teaching that dog by hauling it off? Or you get a dog that'll run a track for two hours and then quit because right. it's like, oh, well, we usually have to leave by now. I'm kind of tired. Let's just stop. Right. Right. Exactly. You know, exactly. I remember I had a dog team once that every, I had a loop. I like to snack my dogs when I'm out. I had a loop at a, that was about, I don't know, it was about 30 miles. And then about 15 miles, there was this nice spot that was out of the wind, sunny and, you know, good, good place to stop for a second, put down a hook, go and give them a snack. It got to the point where those dogs expected to stop there. Oh, yeah. And not only did they expect to stop there, but if we didn't stop there, they were just like sulky and pissy the entire way home. You know, and I don't want that with oh, yeah. any. And that was the last time I ever did that with a team. I don't want that with my dogs. I don't. I want them to take their cues from me i don't want to get so predictable that they can't actually break out of that mold of predictability right um so yeah I, I think that's a good point you know that it's the men taking care of the mental aspect of the all this training is is something that we actually as as dog trainers we don't actually talk about that much no or if we do it's really small personal groups i think yeah like i'm really lucky that there's you know my hunting partner brand and i i mean i'm constantly bouncing things off of mm -hmm. and there's you know a small group of guys that i do like talking to mm-hmm but you also feel kind of like the weirdo of the group. Like you said, well, a lot of the listeners are probably going to think we're like crazy. But I yeah. feel like it's like 
mathematically, I can tell you, you'll never walk into a brick wall. You know, you just keep going halfway and you're never going to run into it. Right. Right. Well, take off running and end up with a nose looking like yours right now. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it, there's a, uh, you can dissect mm. all of this to the umpteenth degree. Right. I mean, we could just For keep sure. dissecting and dissecting and dissecting every little piece. Mm-hmm. And, and you might be getting closer to the answer. You might be getting farther away. You know, you don't know. You just got to really, it's like that perfect balance between logic and gut. Yeah. And I think that's the hard part because you can't necessarily teach either one. Right. Like nobody knows your situation, your dogs your environment like you do Mm -hmm. and you also got to have some faith in yourself too you know it's it's interesting man i i really enjoy it that's why i love talking with you and and like jared yeah and you know even ross ross elwinger when i get talking to him about training and stuff too it's it's crazy you know we'll all have a little different point of view maybe but more often than not we all pretty much land at a general landing zone, right? Like, yeah, we might be on the fringe, but it's like when you really get into that mindset and the people who really do sit and think about what is going on, I think a lot of us end up real close. I think so too, you know, and <clears throat> excuse me, it's, I think so too. And that, That reassures me when I see very, very good people, people doing it to at a level that I hope to achieve at some point. When I see, you know, I talk to people like that and they are, yeah, fully on board, fully on the same page. Um, Or even, you know, (laughs) even being like, you know, I've talked to Jared a couple times where he's like, You know, I have like, I think this dog's doing this and this is my opinion about it. And he'll be like, "Ah, I'm not so sure about that. You know, and he'll give me, you know, he'll he'll give me his perspective. And, you know, nine times out of 10, it's like, okay, that I hadn't considered that. And, you know, a lot of the times he's right. And I love stuff like that because, you know, okay, I may look like an idiot being like, I think this dog is doing this just to piss me off, you know? But in the end, it definitely gives me another tool, another place to go, you know, another well to draw from later on when I end up in a similar situation and be like, well, this kind of reminds me of that thing that Jared talked about that one time. I just had that moment when you mentioned something about, oh, what was it? Just a couple minutes ago, we were talking about... um, Oh, calling dogs off of tracks. Yeah. Like, I I don't know when this is going to air. So, I mean, I can't say if it's an upcoming episode or a past episode. But, like, that was the topic that we were talking about is the effects of calling dogs off a game. Mm -hmm. The wives' tales that go with it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, really what, what does that break down to at the dog's level? Like, are you taking the drive out of them? Are you doing this? Mm. You know, and we'll argue both sides, I'm sure. You know, there's guys that will argue if you can call a dog off of a good track, you know, that dog doesn't have enough hunt in it. And then there's others of us that will say, well, if that dog's not going to realize that what I'm telling it is more important than its natural desire, we're just not going to mesh. Right. You know, and it's funny because, like, I didn't say that to you, but yet that comes up you know, in these circles, no matter how big or small, you sure. know, if you've got one buddy to talk to, as long as you can all keep e- egos aside mm. and, and strip it down to the dogs, man, you'll be amazed at the conversations you'll have. Oh, it's so true. It's so true. And you know, it's, if you can get past the egos, you know, there's somebody that once said, and I can't remember who it was, but I, I love the saying. It's one of my favorite dog training related sayings is that, uh, you know, a man's ego is a terrible burden for a dog to bear. Yep. And, you know, I, I think that's, that's so true. 
we have, I believe we'll, we have a responsibility to the dogs to be flexible enough to learn ourselves. Oh yeah. You know, instead of trying to smash, you know, a square peg into a round hole that we are actually flexible enough to adjust. And oh yeah, you have to. You have to or you're just never going to get you're just never going to get anywhere and it can be a painful process, man. You know, it it really can. You know, especially You got to stay fluid. Yeah, you have to and especially in the start, that can be really tough, you know. It, it, you you want to get that black and white do this and then do this and then do this and then do this and in the end you'll have a finished dog you know wouldn't that be great if that was the case send me that recipe right exactly when you find it send it over yeah it's never gonna happen and you know for like a, a beginner you know like like i am and have been it's it's just it's You know, you, it's finding that balance between having little enough ego that I can look at what I've done and realize the mistakes that I've made, but having enough ego to be confident that I confident enough in what I'm doing to see it through to the end. Yeah. You know, in this because you, there's there's got to be confidence there. If you're standing there like a big question mark, you're going to get a bunch of dogs that are going to be looking at you like your big question mark. Like, like this guy, this guy clearly has no clue. Does he know how to get home? <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like I'm not feeling good about this. This guy, this is our ride home. You know, it's true though. But like I said, the fluidness of it. Because, like, let's say the other night, for example, they've been sitting. You know, you're expecting a whole different ball game. Honestly, you're, I was going to the woods thinking this is going to be a total, total disaster. <laughs> like dogs that you know are fully capable of doing things right, and they're going to go do something stupid. You know, find a skunk or, or, or something, right. and you just kind of go into it because you know that's a lot different than coming off, you know, a week of hard hunting. And they're tuned in and mentally tough and they're they're a machine. It's like, okay, right. we're throwing wrenches and everything. So even that dog that I've hunted behind for three, three and a half years, it's a different ball game tonight than it was last mm. time we went out oh. or the next time we go out. It, it's you've got to just be so objective to it in my eyes. You know, and there's always going to be, like you said, the guys that are just going to kick the box loose and go and and I'm not knocking that. You know, if, if no. you're happy with the result, um, you know, you just like going out there and you catch what you catch and you don't what you don't. There's nothing wrong with that. Right. But I, I'm never that guy anymore. I used to be. Now it's like, why? What happened? What just happened? Right. Right. You I know, mean, yeah, totally, totally agree with you there. Uh, totally. It's, you know, it's, it's the difference between being a dog runner and a dog trainer. Right. To me, you know, you can get out there and you can have a blast with, you know, just being out there with your dogs, smashing around the woods, putting up game. That's great. Like I have, I'm in no way criticizing that. Oh, you know, but it's, it's, as you say, it's the, you know, I, I want to know why. I want to know what worked. I want to know what didn't work. I want to know what, to the degree that I can, I want to know what is it that made this work out versus what is it that made this, turn this into a train wreck, you know, instead of just well, sort of chop, chalking it up to like, oh, well, it wasn't our day today. Uh, clearly not, but why? Right. You know, are there well, it all starts with an excuse. Right. Like, and I'm not saying excuse in a bad way. It's like, oh, well, we lost it because, oh, they, you go across a grass covered hillside after the dews burned off, or, you know, oh, they just lost the scent. Well, why'd they lose the scent? Right. What was it? You know, 
why did this happen and dissect it down. But again, I, I don't know. Sometimes ignorance is bliss. In some ways, I'm like, man, I wish I was the old me where you could just go kick a dog loose and be happy just driving around. Now I'm like analyzing and watching right. and trying to keep tabs. And it's like, okay, what what are we doing here? What What's going on? Something's not right. Something just went weird. Right. It, it's a whole different ballgame. It is. And I think that that's, that's something that the, the, the people like, like us, you know, that we're, we can nerd out and overanalyze this stuff. I, I think that's something that it's important to remember for us is, is that, you know, don't overanalyze it to the point where you lose sight of why you're out there in the first place. Right. Yeah. Right. It's like a tightrope walk. Right. It's like, it's the lifestyle. It's the, it's the, you know, being out there watching the dogs do their thing, you know, and I like to be a part of it. I like to enjoy, you know, I, I like to know why they're doing what they're doing, but you know, I've, I've said it before, you know, the, the biggest challenge for me anyway has been, you know, just, just letting go, you know, I don't need to be on top of those dogs all the time. And that's a challenge for me because from my other experiences, you know, the sheep dogs and those, the, the, you know, the obedience stuff and the, and the, um, the sled dogs, you know, there, there you were fully plugged into every at little detail of what they were doing at all times. Right. Whereas here it's, you're not, you know, you need to be aware, but ultimately, you know, you got to just kind of get out of their way and let those dogs do their thing to a much larger degree than any other sport, dog related sport, or even, you know, animal related sport or, or pastime yeah, that I've been a part of more yeah. hands on. this the the hounds are very hands off in the execution yeah. of what you know we're breeding and training for ultimately you know they're doing it without with a they're doing it without you basically you know you're going to plug in yeah. at some point but you know well and, and i think that's like kind of my last food for thought i guess yeah is at some point personal enjoyment is the why mm-hmm you know, why, why are we doing this? Your personal enjoyment and your personal satisfaction with your pack and, mm -hmm. or your dog or your situation, you know, that's all on you. Absolutely. And, and that plays a big part of it. So I, I don't know, man, I, I listened to that last episode you did and it hit home and that kind of got me excited about this one. Like this was a pretty laid back conversation of a couple dudes nerding out, but mm -hmm. I think it's going to hit home with people i think that last episode was i don't know i you do a lot of podcasts you know what it's like mm. there's certain ones that you just you got a gut feeling it's like if one person hears that you know that that's a good one yeah that, that's gonna hit home with someone i think so you know and I, I i that's what i liked about that last podcast i i agree with you i i got that feeling as well that it was like if one if one newbie who's gotten their butt kicked online by some butthead Facebook bully. Right. Here's this. And it's like, okay, well, I guess I won't give up. All right. Like, you know, that's, that's going to be key because the thing is, is that so many of these people, these youngsters that are starting the sport and this will be my last food for thought as well. I'll let you get to bed here, but, um, <laughs> They have what they lack in experience. They make up for in in energy, dedication, and also they have a very, very clear idea of what is motivating them to do this. And it's not to go out and win a world hunt. That's that's not, you know, to crush everybody at Autumn Oaks. That's not why they're doing it. They're doing it because they love to be out there with their dogs. They are enjoying it for all of the best and purest reasons. And I, I think that, you know, in, in a lot of ways, I think that if people could get off, get off of their egotistical high horses, I, I actually think that the, the, the exchange there from, you know, the sort of the people who have been doing it for long enough that they've maybe lost sight of why, the pure joy of just being out there with your dogs. If they could get a little bit of that back from this newbie, 
a little bit of that perspective yeah. back from this newbie while giving this newbie a little bit of information to maybe help them along their way. I, I think that we'd be building each other up in a much different way than I, I yeah. see happening, at least online and in, in, in a lot of different medias. You know, I, because uh, sometimes you just need that encouragement. I think I, so. I guarantee you, Barry, mm -hmm. I would not be. I would not be doing this right now. Like I wouldn't be running dogs. I wouldn't be, you know, employed at W. Mm -hmm. I would have never kept doing my own thing. I was ready to just hang it all up. Mm. I was done. Frustrated, you know, just it, it wasn't, let's say Facebook at the time, but you know, the situation was not real conducive to growth as a houndsman right. in, in my early years. Um, Except for Tony Witcherly. Mm. I mean, hands down, he's, I, I told him, I said, I think I'm done, Tony. I'm about ready hanging up. And I was half joking, half. Mm. I mean, I was really thinking it because it was like you're beating your head against the wall. And he looks, <laughs> I'll never forget it. You know, he looks at me, he's like, Well, and there's this big long pause. Tony, <laughs> Tony like, he starts talking, you know, and then there's that big, long, like he's thinking this all the way through. Right. <laughs> and, and he says, well, I don't know if I do that, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then it broke into a conversation. But right. It's like he he knew I was he knew I was at that point, just like us with these dogs. You know, when when that dog was at its breaking point, I, I could tell. Right. And I th I think he could tell, like, I was pretty beat down and I needed a win. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we got talking and uh, that's the only reason I'm still doing this. It's right. the reason I got, you know, everything in my life at this moment was one moment over throwing it, you know, throwing it all away potentially just because I was getting beat down. Right. And and it made you refocus. Yeah. So I, ho I hope it hits home with somebody, man. I think that last episode was really cool. Yeah, I, I appreciate you know. that. And, you know, I, I I hope that you know I hope that we do some of that same stuff. You know, I know I know both you and Jared. Um, you know, and I, I mean a bunch of people. Uh, you know, you and Jared and Eric and and you know Mark Dufresne. You know, when that whole thing went down with Dan, um, I was down man i was way down like i was like considering yeah. like do i even want to try to keep this going because you know i've got a a dog that quit from being bitten in the face by a pup <laughs> and like you know it's just like this is just turning into this just everything felt like a train wreck and it, i mean at that point it kind of was yeah you know but if i'd gone online and been like ah, i think i might want to quit you know I probably would have based on the feedback that kind of a post would have gotten, you know? <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's, it's, there are people out there who actively want what's best for the sport and what's best for the sport is recruitment. Yeah. What's best for the sport is these young, enthusiastic, or you don't even need to be young. You could be 70 years old and getting into it for the first time. Energetic, enthusiastic people who want to do this. And for sure, you know, it's like I said, I went a little bit off the rails there on that last podcast, but you know, the, the, the people out there that just, you know, kick you while you're down on social media, you guys suck. <laughs> Quote unquote, Quote, you are the bottom. I, I can't even remember what you said. You are the worst. <laughs> you are the worst laughing. we have to offer is what I said. That, that was it. <laughs> and it's, it's apps. I stand 100% by that. And it's why, you know, a lot of times I'll, on these different pages, you know, I'll take, I'll actually take the time to contact people, you know, uh, that are getting their butts kicked and be like, Hey, you're, you're dealing with the, the bottom of the barrel here. You know, you're dealing with the, 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 the rotten apples here. Yeah. And even if they've got a profile in the sport, these are not good people. Well, that's what I appreciate about what you're doing, man. Like, I love, like, your podcast is very different mm -hmm. than every other podcast out there. Yeah, yeah that's the cool thing. Is like <laughs> everybody's kind of got our own, 
our own thing going. I always thing, enjoy yeah. talking with you. Yeah. And, you know, it is such a different perspective and it is encouraging, you know, like it, it's really cool to see. I appreciate I that. killing it, man. I appreciate that. I really do. And I appreciate you coming on it this late in the more late, late in the, uh, late in the evening for you, man. <laughs> No, no, we just turned over to early morning now. Okay, we're we've hit morning. Yeah, I guess we have. So, well, thanks for coming on. We're on this the morning. same day. We're good to go now. Oh uh, yeah. Well, get some sleep. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me on. It was good catching up. It's been way too long. It has been too long. We'll talk to you. We'll have to do this again. Yeah. Let's do it. Man, I love that sound.